What up, party people? Welcome to yet another edition of DJ to DJ. I am your man, DJ Fernando G. And as always, we have another amazing talent with me. Let's welcome Michael Trance. What's up, brother? How are you, man? Good, man. How you doing? I'm doing well, doing well. I truly love your setup behind you, man. That freaking looks awesome. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's you know it's all about setting the mood and stuff so there you go well i love all your electronics off on the wall there what, what are those modules sound what, what, what do you got there describe a little bit um so there's probably like there's some drum machines there a couple of synthesizers um there's an mpc x there that's on the bottom um yeah i mean i've got gear like all over the place so <laughs> <laughs> I got stuff, like in storage and so, it, I mean, really, it's just about um, the studio that I'm in now is much smaller than what I had uh, in L.A. So, uh -huh. um, you know, I kind of have to have some stuff in storage and then I have certain things that are, you know, easily accessible. Mm -hmm. And I guess it just kind of depends on the day to day, like what I'm working on or that week, what the project is. Um, so I basically just pull out what I'm going to be needing for that week. Nice. Very nice. Very cool. All right, man. So um, as always, we always backtrack a little uh, to the origin. Yeah. So let's uh, let's do that and uh, start off with the first question that I ask every single DJ on DJ to DJ. When did you discover DJing and how did you go about learning to beat mix? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, well, I don't feel so bad now because you've already like, you know, talked with uh with Richard and everything. So I don't feel so bad. Like, you know, yeah. I'm sounding like I'm dinosaur or something like that. <laughs> but I mean, realistically, my entire family, they're all musicians, um, cool. uncles, my dad, uh, even my mom, uh, who sang in the choir in high school. So a lot of music, uh, in the family. And as you know, I was growing up as a little kid, all the, uh, family parties and things like that, that, you know, our family parties were massive all the time. And it wasn't a thing of that we had a large family. Mm -hmm. It was more so all of the friends and people that they had from other bands and things like that. And so our parties usually were, um, you know, several bands that would set up and, you know, the family parties would last literally like all day and night. <laughs> so it would start off as a barbecue and then it would turn into like an evening you know, function and pretty much throughout the day, um, you know, it was just multiple bands that would be playing. Wow. You so know, it was a full blown concert then. Yeah, pretty much. And I didn't really understand until, you know, I got older, you know, like looking back at some of the pictures and some of the people that I met, you know, where it's like, oh, Theo so and so, you know, where they're just really close friends of the right. family. Um, and then I started realizing that a lot of these people that I grew up with, um, that my uncles were playing with were um, a lot of the guys from bands like Santana, uh, Tierra, wow. and all these kind of guys. So, you know, that's all I ever grew up around. And so, you know, my uncles and everybody was always asking, you know, what instrument was I going to play or, you know, what I was going <laughs> to take up. And I, you know, I just, I don't know. Like I, I started, I, I took, you know, piano lessons and I picked that up really quick. I played the violin, played the guitar a little bit played drums for a little bit and you know I had these really short stints with them because it's like I, I learned them really quick but mm -hmm. it didn't like I just wasn't interested like it didn't feel the passion it wasn't until break dancing was becoming a thing mm -hmm. uh, and as I was watching you know like videos and you know whatever shows were coming on I was always always attracted more so to the guy that was in the back which was the DJ and how he was basically manipulating beats and records and doing the scratches and stuff. And that's kind of like what caught my ear. So that's essentially what drove me into uh, DJing. And so I, you know, like everybody else, I didn't, at that age, nobody's taking me serious that, you know, I wanted to be, be and a DJ. And how old were you at this time? It's probably like maybe eight. Wow. Eight, yeah, eight or nine. Little guy. And yeah, really small. and. You know, I was like, oh, you know, asking my parents, hey, you know, can can I have like turntables and a mixer? I, I'd like to I'd like to DJ. And back then, it's not like it is now where there's so many different price barrier entry points. Right. right. That makes it much easier for somebody to get into DJing now. Like you could literally spend, you know, under a thousand dollars 
you know, even under $600 really, yeah. you know, and you could have a DJ set up, including music because music's even yeah. easy to get now, exactly. you know? Um, whereas back then in order just to get into DJing was over a thousand dollars, you know, and that doesn't even include your music, Yeah, you know, cause you had to buy vinyl. So, exactly. uh, you know, it's not like I had a job or anything like that. So it, it was really difficult to try and, you know, get into that. Um, so I think what I ended up doing was, uh, you know, at first, I I think it was for my ninth birthday, my ninth or 10th birthday, I ended up asking my entire family just for cash. I didn't want any toys. I didn't want clothes. I didn't want anything. I went to all my uncles, everybody privately. Money. Yeah, I went to them <laughs> privately because my parents were against it, really. Um, they weren't like with it at all. Mm. So I had to kind of like, you know, secretly go to family members and just say, hey, you know, shh, can you give me some cash for my birthday? I'm trying to save up for something. And that's what I did. And so at the end of the day, I think um, I ended up walking away with like almost $150, $175, you know, for a kid. Yeah, that's a lot. Back then, you know early 80s you know that that's a lot of money yeah um so <laughs> we went i remember one day man um so i had my money in hand i didn't remember my parents didn't really understand how i was getting all this money and why <laughs> so we ended up going to fedco and fedco was essentially costco, costco you know that's yeah. what costco is today back then you had fedco um and so went into fedco and you know fedco had an electronics section and so I went over there because there was this affordable mixer that I had been eyeballing for a while. It was like 99 bucks, you know, but it was an Audio-Technica and Audio-Technica back then, their, mixer, their mixers were known as ATUS, right. A-T-U-S. And it was, the, it was the AM100 or the AM200, something like that. And I went there, cash, bought the mixer, grabbed it. Guy gave me the box. I went back. When my mom wasn't looking, I just put it in the cart. I had the receipt for it. Get out to the car. And as she's unloading, she sees this. And then I have the receipt. I paid for it. And literally, like, my mom threw a shit fit. <laughs> you know, knows, like, the yeah, that I paid, you know, $100 for this electronic device. And they didn't really understand what it was, you know. Right, and right. and my dad was, wasn't too thrilled either. But at the end of the day, it's not like it came out of their pocket. Right. You know, this was my money. I wasn't taking it back. And this is something that I wanted to do. And so um, one of my uncles had a, an extra turntable. And luckily, it happened to be one of the older techniques that had uh, the little dial for the, you know, for the pitch. And then I had another turntable that, yeah. yeah. And then I had another one that my aunt gave me. And it was just some other off-brand you know, turntable, no pitch adjustment or anything. Nothing. And I took that. And then the leftover money, I went and bought some records. And that's essentially how I started, um, you know, uh, mixing it and, and really like learning how to beat mix was really difficult because it was only one turntable that you could adjust the pitch. Right, right. So the technique that I came up with was if I was mixing to the right, I would keep the one with the pitch on the right. So if I was mixing to that one, um, obviously I could adjust it and it was easy. Right. Now, when I was going back to the other turntable that had no pitch adjustment, what I had to do was basically I would make adjustments on the one that was playing very, you know, so slightly. Subtle. And as soon as the other one kind of, you know, caught up right. to speed, because eventually at some point it locks in for a few seconds. Right, right. And when it would do that is when I would, you know, quickly just mix on over. Hence how I started coming up with my quick mix stuff. Because I had to quick mix right. because I couldn't hold right a mix. I had to do it quick. Right. <laughs> so that's essentially how I kind of developed my whole quick mix style of doing things quick because I had to. You had no choice. That's cool, man. No well, well, you definitely started off with a better mixer than I did. I started off with the Radio Shack Realistic Mixer. No, Adis was no better than that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a little was bit nice. a little bit more elevated than the real. Mine mine just had a little headphone jack. Uh, it had a, a fader for a microphone, two phones, but no crossfader. Yeah, no crossfader. Little button on the I remember sides that. and stuff. It was hilarious. And then, yeah. uh, and then I my I did get a technique. A techniques. And this one had the little uh, pitch control with the little knob. And then I ended right. up getting another realistic turntable. They were belt driven, 
So uh, it was always a pain in the butt, man. But that's yeah. wild. So what was your first event that you recall that you said this, you know, you went out and you did a, a full night event? You know, was it a private event? Was it a, what was it? Well, I think um, the first thing that I did uh, back then, obviously I needed a, I needed to generate income, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I knew that I really, really loved it. Um, I obviously, I was sticking with it. It wasn't like where I learned the piano and then I got bored and I wanted to do something else. Right. Um, you know, I stuck with it. And so I knew that I had to find a way to make some money because I wanted to eventually be able to get the, the real techniques and a real good mixer. Right. Um, so what I ended up doing was just a ton of like side jobs and stuff to save up, you know, cash and everything. And, um, and what I would do is I would make little small mixtapes with the old gear, but it was good enough to where it was just a quick thing. And back then, again, remember, you know, no social media or anything. Yeah, so people nothing, were always nothing. looking for DJ mixes on cassette. Yep. Um, and so I would sell them for like, you know, five bucks, you know, mm -hmm. and so I would do that and chores and everything. And I, and oh, I saved up. Enough. Bootlegger. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. I mean, that's, that's what I was doing. I was trying to just perfect the mix, you know, and, and right. at the same time trying to make some money. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't until uh, I think my freshman year of high school, going into my freshman year of, in high school where I had saved up enough money and I had approached my parents and I asked if they could just help out. Like I had at least half. And so my thing was, I'm going to continue. I'm going to start a mobile DJ business. Um, and so what I'll do is I will make payments back on whatever's left. So whatever I make off the gig, half of it will go back to, you know, what I owe you guys. And then the other half I'll, you know, put aside. And so they agreed and, you know, cause they'd seen, obviously I was making this work, you know, the best way possible. And so once I had that, then is when I started my mobile DJ gig. And so I took, um, you know, some leftover money. I got my business cards made and the way that I promoted myself was I didn't hand them out to my friends or anything. I went to an all guys Catholic high school. So what I did was I went to all the girls catholic high schools and then obviously meeting all the all the females over there instead of get oh let me get your phone number here's my card and go. so i would hand out my card to all the females and realistically it was the females that were mainly on all of the high school committees booking djs for all the dances right. and i knew that so that's what i did it's like i kind of just played on the fact that all right cool let's flirt meet up whatever but i knew that i had a bigger uh, um, chance of my number and, you know, getting passed around and possibly getting clients if I targeted the female audience first, Smart uh, because, because up until that point, I had nothing but problems with guys, you know, uh, it, Jealous. It, it, it's just, it's, yeah, it, it was just a lot of guys hating. And even at a young age in junior high and making mixtapes, like Nobody ever believed that I was the one making those mixed tapes. Yeah. Like every guy would always be talking shit. Oh, you think you're this? You think you're that? Oh, that ain't shit. You know, because the girls would tell me, right. you know, that 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 this this is what these guys, even my own friends that were supposedly friends, would say this stuff. So I was like, all right, then I'm just gonna focus on females, you know, because uh, I just felt like it would be easier, and it did. And so my uh, my first gig was a mobile dj gig uh it was for a very good friend of mine from junior high her name was laura garcia um she played a really really big um part in where i am today even though she doesn't even think about it or think so <laughs> um, she was the one that really even through junior high would always tell me don't listen to anybody like just keep doing what you're gonna do she goes you've got some talent she goes i've i've been to other parties and i've heard like really good dj she goes and you're like on point to do something really cool. So just stick with it. Once I went to high school, I went to all's guys and we lost contact. We still remained, you know, friends. And every once in a while she would call in to check up and make sure that I was still doing well in school and that I was still pursuing my music interests and to not give up. And it wasn't until I think like my junior year where she, my sophomore or junior years where she was calling me and she was saying that, um, that she was starting to hear my name amongst like the crowds and the dancers and like the party crews and all this stuff. And keep in mind, I was going to school out on the West side 
by third in Fairfax and she was going to Roosevelt High School in East LA. East LA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had already kind of stretched myself out, you know, eastbound just with mixed tapes, you know, cool. and and doing like, you know, a couple of high school dances here and there. Um, so I did her quinceanera first. That was my first mobile DJ gig and she wow. gave me that gig. Cool. Uh, so I did that. Uh, and then after that, I did a, you know, I think throughout my freshman and sophomore year, I did a, a couple of, you know, I was doing mobile stuff. Once I got into my sophomore years where I started to realize I didn't really like doing mobile DJing. Mm -hmm. And it's where I started to, um, you know, notice more of the underground scene and clubs and radio. And that's where my, my interest was. I wasn't more interested in doing that than doing mobile DJing. Um, and I just felt like I just really didn't have you know, the personality to be that kind of mobile DJ where I'm talking to everybody and I'm emceeing on the mic and yeah. I'm playing all kinds of music and all right, let's get, that wasn't me, you know, I, and I knew that and there's nothing wrong with that. Like there's guys that are really, really good at doing that kind of yeah. thing. And yeah. when those kind of events come up, guess what? I hire them. If I get hired to play music at some of these wedding events, and I, I get them every so often where somebody wants me to do a club style set at their wedding, mm -hmm. I will still bring in somebody that is more suited to handle the mobile DJ gig and handle the wedding and all that stuff. And all I do is I come in and I do an hour or maybe two hours, but the person that I hired handles everything else, the MC, so that they get a great experience because I know I'm not that type of person. It's interesting how so you, that's how you fine. position that because uh, you know, early on you talked about how you know, your entire family was, were, were the, the musicians and, and you were like, yeah, okay, cool. You know, you, you dabbled in it, but you didn't feel that you were a part of that. Your, your, your essence was actually elsewhere. That's interesting. Yeah. And, and now you kind of did the same here with your DJing aspect of it. Yeah. It's, it was just really about like finding where I wanted to end up. You know, mm -hmm. it's about setting specific goals for yourself. And I think that that's, one thing that a lot of DJs fail to do. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons why a lot of DJs don't make it. You know, when I got into doing this, I didn't get into this to meet girls or to party. And that's a huge, huge difference between, I think, somebody like myself and a lot of other DJs that just get into it because they just want to party, have some fun, meet yeah. girls, whatever. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just two types of, of people. And I went into this head first as a business from very, very young um, because I, because my family was so against it and my father and everybody didn't think that I would make it. Mm. I was driven more so to make a point to like show them I will make it in this business. I will make a career out of it so you can eat your words, there you, go. you know, you know, um, and so it's you were, because you were just, you were, decided and nobody nobody was ever going to change your mind you you had this from a young age after you get out of high school did you go to college did you study music did you study engineering what happens at that point yeah so after i barely scraped through high school <laughs> <laughs> like most of us <laughs> yeah you know honestly like um it, it wasn't even so much uh my grades or anything because i actually ended up graduating um, with really good grades and I was set to like go on to do a bunch of other things. It just didn't interest me. Mm -hmm. uh, like a lot of people don't know that like, I studied business law and I was ready to go into that as a backup in case, you know, music didn't work out. Right, right. And I just didn't pursue it. I, I was really like dead set on music. So what I ended up doing after I got out of high school and I graduated um, I first went to Pasadena City College because they had a really good radio broadcasting radio program yeah, yeah. there. So I went there and I did, I think, two years at, uh, at PCC uh, in the radio broadcasting and communications because I really wanted to learn more and get into radio. Mm -hmm. uh, and then during that time, I had already started uh, doing guest mixes and, you know, on Power 106 and stuff. And after I was done there... I then transferred over to Long Beach City College because from there I went in to get my associate's degree as a commercial record production engineer. Um, and the reason I chose that school was because they were one of the only schools that actually had full studio consoles mm -hmm. uh, in there that students could actually come in and use on the weekends. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, so I decided to go there and it, it was really crazy because um, I'm a really big fan of, um, you know, Tim Burton movies, not so much for the movies themselves, but the, the chemistry that he always has with Danny Elfman and the music that encompasses Sword, it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so my instructor, one of my instructors at LBCC was um, she ended up being one of the engineers for Oingo Boingo for many, many wow. years. So it, it was kind of cool. Like I already, I loved Oingo Boingo back then yeah, and yeah. always thought Danny Elfman was fascinating and just kind of out there, weird yeah, guy, but yeah, yeah. I was talented, you know, it's like, I knew that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I learned with her and basically there was all these prerequisites that I needed to complete, but I was already by that time, I was already producing. I was already like, I had already gotten myself on the radio I was already making records. So her thing was just, you know what, Uh, just come in at the end of the semester and just take the final and bring in whatever projects you've worked on and then submit them and I'll take that as your final. And that's what I did. And so, you know, I went through all that. And so, yeah, so I did get, you know, schooling on the back on the back end there. But I'll tell I'll tell you right now. And and I get asked this a lot. There are a ton of different like online schools out there some that are affordable and they teach you really good stuff and some that are just like way overly priced yeah and it's not like it's accredited or anything like that and at the end of it all you know some people end up with thousands and thousands of dollars of debt you know and they've got this musical education but it's nothing that's accredited and now they can't get a job anywhere really doing that you know um, so now they're in this boat of now I'm in debt and I'm not making any money, money. Yeah. you know? That so, um, you know, one thing that I did was it was a lot of, uh, you know, real life experience and that's really what got me out there and helped me move up the ladder. It wasn't the schooling, like nobody ever gave a shit about, you know, what was right. on paper. Yeah. I always had it in my head that, it, you know, oh, you should have something on paper. You should have. OK, cool. So I did that because that's what my parents wanted and that's what they thought. Cool. I went and did that. But it doesn't yeah. honestly. And, it, and and it's funny because it doesn't matter what you study. The reality is that's exactly what happens in any industry, whether yeah. it's music, whether it's attorney, whether it's, you know, whatever it might be. At the end of the day, it's who you know. Who you know sure. that's gonna get you up that ladder? You know, you make the friends, you make the contacts, you network properly in the industry that you want to be in, and you make your way up. Because just like you say, you know, it's like, I mean, I worked for radio since 1989. Um, I handled marketing promotions departments for several radio stations here in Los Angeles, and I gotta tell you, I never looked or asked for anybody's degree. You know what I mean? It was always the experience that they could bring. And who brought them to me, you know? I mean, that's the reality of it, you know? And it's like so many corporations and companies that say, oh, you have to have a bachelor's degree. And they don't even look <laughs> at that, man. You know, it's like, no give me a freaking break, man. It's like, nobody does that, you know? And it, and it sucks. I mean, you do want to take the education. You want to learn. You want to do it right. But at the same time, if you're looking to get a job based on your bachelor's degree or whatever degree you get, it ain't going to happen. Nope. It's crazy. No, no, no. Yeah. And and I think that's a big, you know, misconception with a lot of people is that they, I think they think that if I have this degree from this school that says, I know how to make beats properly, or I know how to make music and produce properly, that it's going to open up like these magical doors or something. And that is not the case at all, because really what it comes down to is, um, you know, musical talent, that's number one, yeah. because yeah. you can have all these great ideas. And so long as you've got that creativity and you've got that sound, there are other guys that all they do is engineer and mix so they can make your stuff sound really, really good. Exactly. So that's not a problem. You don't have to be the best mixing engineer. You don't have to be, you know, the best mastering engineer. Right. Like there's people that you can hire to do those specific things so that you can solely focus on the creative process of music making. Yeah. Come up with the concept. Yep. So, and I think that's where a lot of people, you know, everybody wants to do it themselves, you know? Uh, And, and it's understandable because you don't always have the money to really hire, Mm -hmm. you know, people. But I think if you're out there networking and you're getting yourself around a lot of people that are on the same path as you, 
you're going to meet other people that are doing these things. Exactly. And it's better to kind of like get with them at the early stages of their careers so that you all come up together, you know, and everybody's going to work with you, you know, um, and there's ways, to, yeah, there's ways to do it. Technology, obviously, it evolves every two seconds, especially when it comes to musical equipment. What was the first piece of equipment that you got when you started producing your own tracks? I think the uh, the first piece of equipment that I ended up getting was it was actually like two or three things that I had to get all in one shot. Hmm. Um, I ended up getting a Roland JP8000 uh, synthesizer. And then, but I think before that I got the, it was an old Atari ST computer. Hmm. And I picked it up for like 150 bucks, you know, and all it did was run Cubase. Yeah. Um, and that was it. And I had an Insonic EPS uh, sampling workstation Those keyboard. Insonics what, were amazing, man. Yeah. That was awesome. And so that, that was the predecessor uh, to the infamous ASR 10. Mm hmm. Um, you know, the ASR 10 came out of the Insonic EPS. So um, that was my, that was pretty much my setup was, you know, an EPS and a synth and everything was pretty much all, you know, sampled. Uh, and from there I had to get a mixer, you know, because again, you know, there was no computers back then. The most that they did was just the sequencing. That was it. Yeah. You couldn't re really record into do the computer or do any of that stuff so you everything was all outboard gear so mm -hmm. i had like a mac uh, a mackie cr 1604 mixer and you know the sampling keyboard and that was it really yeah. like, you know and uh, and then i had to get a dat machine obviously you yeah. had to record everything that dat, little dat dat and remember the a dats <laughs> I oh, man, I hated a that's man. Know. That's that's the one thing I definitely don't miss, man. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of producers now they have it so easy. I mean, back then, if you wanted to track, you know, to do a, a proper, um, you know, track with vocals, yeah. you know, and if you were and if you were somewhat experienced with recording vocals, knowing how to do double vocal takes and you know recording one part on the left, another part on the right. Uh, yeah, you had to have an, like at least two or three ADAP machines if you were yeah. going to try and do that because each ADAP machine only had, you know, eight, eight tracks, tracks on it. Yeah. So, and, 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 and it you, bad, as if it wasn't bad enough, you had to learn, you know, MIDI and then you had to learn SIMTI and all these other elements to it to sync everything up properly. Oh yeah, my gosh, clocking. it was horrendous, man. It was like, yeah. what? <laughs> trying to clock, yeah, trying to clock the ADATs, you know, yeah. either through if you were using SIMTI or if you were using like some sort of like external clock. Yeah. I mean, that's, but that's, you know, that's what gave a lot of that music from back then its own unique kind of flair was those indiscrepancies in the timing, you know, yeah, is yeah, that's true. The shuffle and that real, you know, so, and that's, that's what a lot of the, it's funny because now you have a lot of these plugins that emulate that timing offset now, you know, and everybody's into this lo-fi hip hop and all, and like all that really is, is just, that's how we did music in the early 90s with hardware only and the lo-fi really just came from crappy audio components and noise that got introduced into the signal no. you know from back then you know because you were using tape machines and you were you know things were running into each other more so it was picking yeah. up more noise along the way hence you got that gritty you know kind of sound yeah, yeah. Um, so I just think it's funny like everything is so clean and digital now you could do anything but now hey let's create these plugins to make it sound like shit from right. back from the early <laughs> it's true it's funny because like you know i remember man we used to go nuts when we would spin our records and we you know obviously we were spinning every freaking weekend and after a while you know you start getting the crackling they don't sound as clear and you put the freaking needle on you got this popping and stuff and now you hear some tracks where they're emulating those effects and putting it on top of it overlaying so that you get and i'm like damn man who would have thought that back then we were trying to keep it clean and now they're it's fucking clean. letting it up man yeah it's funny <laughs> it's, it's just crazy you know but again you know it's what i tell people it's like th those were all as much as they were things that were a headache to us um i think it's you know it's all of those things that made that music from back then so special and very unique mm -hmm. you know and it's what makes a lot of 
you know, modern day producers listen to that stuff because they're always listening to it to get ideas. Mm-hmm. And all these new songs that come out now, it's like, oh man, that's nothing but such and such from the 90s. You know, right. they're just rehashing stuff that was already did, which we know this happens. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's it's when they're listening to all that sound, it's like, how did they do that? How did it sound like that? You know, and they don't know anything about hardware and everything that went into it, you know, that made it that sound. It wasn't done on purpose. That was, we were trying to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's how, you know, technology was back then. It was just noisy. And unless you had a lot of really great high-end gear and a great console to run all this stuff mm-hmm. through with gates, yeah. you know, that would close the, the channels, channels down, up, everything up, yeah. you know. If not, then yeah, you you'd ha- you could have sixteen to twenty four analog channels that were open all the time while you're doing your mix down, and unless you're muting stuff and you know where it's coming, you know you're gonna get all that noise. It all gets summed together. So, what would you say your biggest challenge was when you f- your for your first production when you first started producing that first track that that you worked on? I think everything was a big challenge for me because. Uh, I didn't know anything at all. Um, I didn't have anybody mentoring me. Um, I didn't have anybody even really coming over for like a day or two and saying, hey, you know, uh, this is how you set all of this stuff up. And this Mm -hmm. is what MIDI is. And this is what, you know, nobody. So I literally was trying to figure out, you know, as I started adding more gear, you know, into my setup, I was literally trying to figure out what MIDI was, the differences between audio and MIDI, mm-hmm. you know, what MIDI clocking was, you know, and then trying to figure out how to do what we call automation now. Like I want, well, how do I make it so that the filter sweeps up over time and right. I'm not having to do it in real time during the mix down. Exactly. You know? <laughs> uh, and so it, and everything. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about any of that stuff. So a lot of stuff that I did was all done in real time on the fly. You know, not because I meant to do it that way. I just, I didn't know any better. Right, right. You know, um, and so, so many mistakes I made on my records that I did back then that I listen to now, um, where I think it sounds like complete shit, you know, but back then I thought I was like, oh, cool. You know, I did it on my own. Like nobody helped me, yeah. you know, and a lot of people seem to like the records. They didn't sound like, every other record had its own unique thing. And that was probably just because of the flaws and and things that I was doing in the mixing where it could have been better, Hmm. you know, but I just, you know, I just did the best that I could with what I knew and what I was learning along the way. You know, you had other guys like, you know, Mark V and Poogie Bear, you know, who literally were under Juanito's arm Hmm. for a couple of years. So that's perfect. You know, that's where Poogie learned how to get the kicks and all that stuff. Like, smacking hard and everything because he was able to work with Juanito in his studio and understand, you know, the signal flow of things, how to do a mix down, how to set up kicks, how to do all that stuff, you know, whereas, you know, other guys like me, um, we were just figuring out on our own, trying to read the manual, you know, um, and, and and that's like reading Japanese. Yeah. Dude, my, my, I always talk about the story. My first software that I got was cakewalk home studio, man. And I kid you not, man. The, the book was like this thick, okay. Yep. And I'm going through it. And um, AJ Mora was a good friend of mine from back in junior high. And then I'm all like, bro. I said, you know this stuff. I really need your help with MIDI. I don't get it. I don't understand it. He, and he he, oh, he looks at me. He goes, bro. Music instrument digital interface. What? I have no idea what that means, dude. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it was like. You know, help me. I remember plugging that thing in, and I'm like, okay, I got it. And I hit record, and I hit the note, and then a ding, and then nothing. Oh, man, it took me months to figure it out, man. But it would, and in the end, you know, I was able to, like like you, make it work, do things that I, I knew there were easier ways to do it. But I was like, okay, I know what I what the sound that I want. I know this is probably not the way, but I'm getting the sound that I want. So it is right. what it is. Yeah, I mean, it was the same thing for me. It was like, what is this MIDI? Like, what does that mean? What does it do? Okay, and then I had to figure out, like, reading the manual, like, okay, cool. So MIDI is pretty much a way for all of my instruments to communicate with each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's how they can talk, talk to each other. All right, so I kind of understood that concept. But, it, man, like, how much better could my music have been if I had somebody there? All right, so let's do this, set up. This is how MIDI works. You know, somebody actually walking you through 
you know, the process to show you how to get these things set up. And I think like that is one of the biggest differences between us here on the West Coast in LA and let's say like on the East Coast and in the Midwest, you know, like the guys in New York and Chicago, you know, when I went over there a couple of times, you know, and I went to UC Records and the massive building that they were all in, all of the producers were all inside this massive building and they all had their own small studio suites, like rooms that they were working in. So, you know, you're literally walking down the hall. You've got Mozzie on the left. You got Rick Garcia over here. You got Josh Collins, you know, in another room over here. You know, you got CZR down the hall, you know, and everybody's talking to each other. Everybody's like, you know, coming in, checking out what, what they're doing. And when you talk, with a lot of those guys, they always say like, oh, so-and-so is the one that like showed me how to do it and got me into like learning how to do all this stuff. So mm-hmm. there was somebody always there that was kind of like Guiding passing that knowledge on. To, yeah. To the next one. Whereas in LA, everybody was kind of like, oh, fuck you. Like you're, I'm not teaching you shit. I'm not showing yeah. you anything. Everybody yeah. just stayed to themselves, you know, and there was nowhere to really get the information or to understand how to do that. You know, that that's funny that you bring that up because I, I think that that came up in, in, in the DJ world because if you recall, like back in the day, I remember like in the early 80s and stuff, you know, we would get a record and somebody would come up, oh, you know, oh, dude, that's a bad jam. Who, who sings that? I ain't going to tell you. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. Like, where, where, what store did you get it at? I'm not going to tell you. Tell you. Figure it out, you know? And it's yeah. like you, everybody was like so greedy. Just they, it was all like, I'm not going to share this. I'm not going to tell you how I did that. Uh, you know, when people started learning how to scratch and how did you do that? I'm not going to tell you, you know, it was, yeah. it was, it was kind of weird. You know, um, I, I was lucky enough to be able to hang out with, with a few people like, you know, Richard and Richard Vision, you know, AJ Mora, you know, Gordy and the, my other friends that we grew up with, you know, we were helping each other out cause we were learning, but right. other groups that would come to us, and ask us how did you do that or where did you get this we were like we ain't sharing jack you know we ain't telling you nothing you know and it was and yeah. i think that that mentality crossed over unfortunately into the production world once all these djs started growing in and producing their own tracks it was like nobody wanted to share that knowledge because they wanted to be the only ones which kind of yeah. sucks you know it's like yeah. yeah i mean it's like i i understand both sides you know because i'm not going to sit here and be hypocritical and saying that you know throughout the production process or throughout the years like i've been super open to just sharing everything mm-hmm. you know, because part of it is you know it took me time to figure this formula out mm-hmm. because i put in a lot of hours trying to figure out how to separate myself and how to give myself a unique identity both in djing and in music production mm-hmm. you know and I'm not saying that my style of DJing or music production is the best. Or I'm just saying my own unique style, like what represents me as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, and if things that I do like end up being something really cool, you know, then I have the mentality sometimes where I think too many people these days are too used to having information given to them. So they come from this like entitled kind of persona is Mm -hmm. what I feel Mm -hmm. because they can just, you know, pick up a phone and, Oh, I'm going to Google this, this, Oh, how to do that. I'll Google it. Oh, how to do that. I'll Google it. Nobody takes the time to learn shit anymore. Yeah. That's the problem is that you have a ton of lazy ass people out there that would rather just look something up rather than really learn and understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. You can get a recipe to something. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between reading the recipe and copying it and actually like doing the shit and understanding what's happening in the recipe, why these ingredients work together so well, what is it that they do? How do they interact with each other? That makes this recipe so good Mm -hmm. because then you can take that information. And when you know what all those ingredients do, you can do amazing shit with other stuff. Good. That, that's an awesome advice, brother. Awesome advice for anybody that's watching right now and looking to produce. That's amazing advice. Thank you for sharing that. No, yeah. I, you know, and it, and some people be like, oh, that's fucked up. You don't want to share. It's like, no, dude, what I want you to do is I want you to learn your craft. Yeah. 
you know, I can give you, I can give you this preset that I made. Is that going to make you a better producer? No, it's just going to make you more lazy because later on down the line, if you need to create this sound again or something similar to this, you're not going to even know where to start. Yeah, you'll be like, what did I do? How did I do that last time? What, yeah, oh, what yeah, he gave me the, and then you're going to be back. Oh, hey, uh, how do I make it sound like this? It's like, dude, then how do you expect to be a producer? How do you expect to be respected as a producer or, you know, or whatever field you're in if you don't have the, fully, the full knowledge to understand your craft? And I think, and that's, so that's where I'm saying, like, I understand both sides. Like yeah. it's cool to share and learn. And when I meet people and I know that the person that I'm talking to, like they're doing some really cool stuff and they're pretty smart and all right, cool. I don't mind sharing because this person clearly like has some good knowledge. I don't mm -hmm. mind sharing. Cause then he's sharing with me. Cool. Like that's great. Yeah. It's the ones that just, Oh, yeah. I want to be a superstar mega producer, man. Hey, man, uh, why don't you give me, let me copy your drive so I can get all your music. And and then why don't you give me all of your presets that you have for, you know, for Serum or for Salenth, one of the software synths, because I want to make Bass House now. And it's kind of like, dude, get the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> like, you're, Pay your dues, like, man. It's Pay such, your dues. <laughs> it's such a cliche, man, for these guys. Oh, I'm just going to go on the internet. And I'm going to look for a torrent site and I'm going to download all this illegal shit and I'm going to get all this stuff. Nobody wants to invest anything. Nobody wants to put in the time to learn anything. Everybody just wants instant gratification. Like there's some mega producer rock star button that they push and instantly overnight they've got a million followers on Instagram and now they're the shit. <laughs> All right, let's 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 jump back a little bit. Who were your influences? <laughs> you were getting passionate there, bro. <laughs> hey, so, it's all good. It's all good. So let, let's jump back a little bit. When you got started and you were starting to DJ and you were starting to produce, who were your influences? Who were the the the, the, the DJs and, and producers that you were saying, man, these guys, I want to learn how to be better than them. I think when I first started, it was it was kind of tough because I had a lot of like you know, mixtapes that I would listen to that I would get from my older sister from a lot of the disco parties and stuff mm -hmm. that she would go to. So a lot of them I, I would listen to over and over again, but I didn't know who the DJ was because mm -hmm. uh, there was no tags or nothing. It would just right. be, you know. Um, so I think once I started hearing names and identifying, like, you know, certain names, um, I could definitely tell you, like, the Boris and Chris club mix that they used to do when there used to be Kiss AM. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah. But um, for for those of you out there who don't know, like Kiss FM used to have a, another station called Kiss AM, yep. and on Kiss AM it was nothing but nonstop DJ mixes all the time. And I remember on the weekends I would listen to uh, Kiss AM and I would listen to the Boris and Chris uh, club mix. And man, the mega mixes and edits that they would do on there. Yeah. That is what fascinated me, like that kind of stuff. And then, you know, hearing like a couple of other like mega mixed out edits that were coming out of the East Coast. Um, those were like big, you know, kind of influential things uh, for me. So, uh, you know, um, some of the guys like Tony G, uh, mm. you know, from K-Day and those guys yeah, yeah. Uh, that were on there. I used to listen to them all the time and I would listen to how they were cutting and mixing. Uh, like I said, Boris and Chris. And then I think from there, the next big kind of, I would have to say Bad Boy Bill um, from late 89, I think, mm -hmm. is when I got one of his hot mix cassettes. And again, it was that quick mixing, the edits and the mega mix style, which is what uh, really caught my attention. And so that's where I was kind of like, um, I need to be doing stuff like this to promote myself, you know, as a DJ, the, the DJ mixes themselves on cassette need to be interesting. They need to be able to stand out from all the other ones that are out there, you know? Um, so how do I, how do I do that? Right? Like, how do they do these mega mixes? Like, are they using four turntables or what? Like I didn't understand it. Um, and it wasn't until I started to understand about four tracking and, and using a four track. And then um, my buddy, Johnny aftershock, uh, he had one. It was a Fostex XR, XR4 or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember he's like, hey, man, he goes, I'm going to come over to your house one day. Um, I'll bring it and I'll show you exactly like how it's done because his friend, which was uh, Mr. Flashback from Latin Underground, mm -hmm. uh, 
um, he used to DJ under another name. I think they used to just call him Chill or DJ Chill. And he had some really, really cool mega mixes that he did on a four track. But most of these mixes were always like 20 minutes long. Mm. And that was just because the four track cassette, you would run it at high yeah. speed to get better quality. Yeah. So your mix was would only be about maybe 20 minutes of it on there that you could actually get. Yeah. Um, so he brought it over, showed me, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. And then, so it was from there. He's like, I'm a, uh, I'll let you borrow it. And so he left me with that four track, I think for like two weeks. Wow. And, okay. and I was literally on that thing like day and night, like learning how to do tricks and yeah. how to you manipulate the four different tracks on there. And I ended and up with re- and everything. Yeah. And so I ended up, um, you know, releasing one of my first uh, mega mix cassettes. And then I went to all the record shops and I put it on consignment you know, and boom, that's really what did it, you know, for me throughout Los Angeles and everything. It really helped me a lot. That's wild. So who was the big, first big name artist that you worked with? And how did you come about getting that gig? Oh, man. Um, That is a tough one. (laughs) You've worked with a lot of great talent, man. A lot of major talent, so. I honestly, I, I, I can't remember. Um, I just, I think some of the, I think some of the first, I, I, cause what ended up happening was uh, towards the, I think like 99, once we hit the year 2000, um, you know, hard house was kind of already, you know, on its way out. Um, and it was more of like the progressive, you know, kind of UK sound that was coming in and, mm-hmm. And I think like at the time I was kind of just getting frustrated with the whole club scene in general, like the promoters and and all this, all the politics, you Mm -hmm. know, around that. Um, So uh, and then at the same time, uh, around that time is when I got married, I think in 2005 or 2006 or 2004, sorry. And don't so let her, don't let her hear you say that. <laughs> oh, no, no, we, we both we both get it confused sometimes. Actually, he's better with the dates than I am. But um, we we ended up meeting in like 99. And then throughout the early 2000s, uh, you know, I was also trying to focus on on a relationship. And the one thing that I came to realize and not just for myself, but something that I would see with a lot of my friends that were constantly on tour um you kind of had to make a decision on what you wanted to do Mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is you had to decide on am i going to focus everything into my career to continue touring and working my way up or am i going to focus on a relationship and possibly a family and so that's where I was kind of torn because I didn't want to be that guy that was just gone all the time because mm-hmm. uh, I was on tour a lot, like through the 90s and stuff. And I knew that that obviously is one of the reasons why it was difficult for me to even try and hold a relationship during that time. It was just it was really difficult. You, yeah. you, you got to be able to dedicate time exactly. uh, as much de- as much time as you put into your music and everything, your craft. You got to put that same kind of time into your partner, yeah. you know, um, so. I think in 2004, when when we were pregnant uh, with our child, right there, I knew I wanted to I wanted to get married. I wanted to have a family. I knew that I could I didn't want to be gone. um, So I had to kind of figure out exactly what I was going to do with my music career so that I could still stay in music, but still have a family and do all that. Yeah. And so. Um, I ended up going and working uh, full time for Roland at the time. So I became like a product specialist for them. And as I was doing that, I then began meeting a bunch of hip hop artists. And I was doing demos on some of the gear for a lot of these hip hop artists. I would go to their studios and sit down with them and we'd be going over new products. And and as I was like creating hip hop beats and doing stuff and like a lot of them were like, oh, yo, what is what the f- yo? And then so then they started hiring me like, you know, hey, man, like, how can I hire you to come and like, you know, be my engineer or uh, come and work on. We're going to be working on this album. I'd love for you to come 
and work on it with us and you know create some music and stuff and and my response was always like what like <laughs> i'm a house dj like i'm a house producer i i've never done hip-hop like i'm not a hip-hop producer and i would tell them very straightforward like i'm not a hip-hop guy i've never produced hip-hop i don't even play it that much i do it on the radio sometimes i go but that's not my forte like you know there and i think it was uh it was little john i was at his place he was uh he was living in hollywood at the time and he goes um he's uh hey man he goes i don't give a fuck what you do or whatever but that shit right there is fucking (laughs) (laughs) hip-hop so (laughs) yeah so i was like all right um cool you know so i started and that's kind of like how i started uh working with a bunch of really great you know hip-hop artists for a while Mm. um i i kind of dipped out of the la electronic scene because i was focusing on all that because i was trying to build myself up more so as a like songwriter engineer sound designer you know Mm. somebody that would be more in the background in the studio working on stuff where i didn't really have to go anywhere right i could be in my home studio and i could just be working on all kinds of projects you know for anybody anywhere right. really you know and that's the beauty um, of technology and, today that you can do that yeah, you know it, it's yeah. a much much simpler world than where we were when we first got started and like you say you know you work from home you come up with the concept bam send it off they like it it's on yeah and so that's what i did um and so uh, you know i got to work with a lot of really great guys like jermaine dupree um i got to work with rizzo from wu-tang clan Lil John, of course, um, Dougie Fresh at, at one point, got to work with uh, Chad Hugo from the Neptunes with Pharrell, um, got to work with Justin Timberlake once, uh, you know, all these really great, you know, acts throughout the years Huge and everything. Talent. So truly, truly, truly blessed to have been able to, you know, sit in with all of them. And and I think at the end of the day, it it was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me to step away from the typical LA, you know, electronic club scene for a bit mm. because it, it allowed me to really like, like, you know, diversify myself as a musician. Um, it put, it made me put myself in very uncomfortable uh, situations that made me step outside of my box um, to really understand different forms of music and uh, the different personalities of people when they come into the studio and, and what they're looking for and how to work with other people. Um, and that's one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that there is somewhat of a kind of like a secret sauce to collaborating with people. Like not everybody can collaborate together and yeah. you have to be able to identify who you are as a person and who you think you would click with, you know, on a personal level uh, in the studio so that you can collaborate. Um, you, you can't have like two dominating forces in the studio at the same time with diva attitude because you're, you're not going to get, time. yeah, you're yeah. going to clash heads all the time and you're not going to get anything done. And it's just money being wasted every hour that you're in there and you're not accomplishing anything. It's, it's wasted money. Yeah. And, and that's even for, you know, people that have hired me where I've sat in there literally and I was just sitting there and just drinking something and, you know, because they literally spent two to three hours arguing over bullshit while I was there. Wow. Yeah, and I'm getting paid yeah. no matter what, so that's fine, but it's a waste of money. Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah, you could be you I, could be producing as opposed to... I could to, be producing, yeah. I could be doing something else. You know, it's fine. It's easy money, but at the same time, like, I feel bad for them. It's like, you guys are literally wasting money and you're not getting, like, the purpose of all this. This is, this is supposed to be fun like collaborating yeah. supposed to like you know inspire one another and all you guys do is you know argue because each one of you has this diva mentality and everybody wants to be on top and it's like you're missing the whole point of music exactly so we're coming up to the end here what is it that you're working on right now and uh, what can we expect from you in the near future man well, right now I just finished uh, on August 22nd. I finished launching um, a new platform on BPM Supreme, which is called BPM Create. And we have a really, really great uh, team of people uh, that worked with me throughout the year. And collectively, we were able to launch this whole new platform in one year. Um, nice. And it's basically an online uh, digital sample library uh, that 
is completely royalty free. You pay a subscription and you can go on there and you have access to over like 200,000 sounds that are on there. Wow. So it's perfect for, um, you know, music producers, obviously. But uh, one of the unique things about it is obviously on BPM Supreme, you have a lot of DJs that go there and they're, you know, that's where they get all their music from. Yep. And you can add this on uh, to your uh, music subscription as well. So now you have access to both platforms. Oh, that's cool. And a lot of, yeah, and a lot of DJs are usually like, but I'm not really a producer. And I'm like, have you ever done a DJ edit? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever done a mashup? Yeah. All right. Then you're doing some form of music production yeah. and you're doing that kind of stuff. You're going to need audio content. You need drum loops. You need effects that can do the transitions, all that kind of stuff. Yep. Yep. I go, so any form of audio manipulation that you're doing, even, even if it's not music production per se, even if you're just doing digital editing, you still need audio material. If you want to add some congas on top of a part, go find a conga loop, drop it in there. Simple. You don't have to be this experienced music producer. And then they're like, oh, shit. Okay. Now, now let's say it, it, you come across a person that is more a producer and doesn't really care about the DJing and the, and the music aspect. And they can obviously uh, register for BPM Create. Oh, yeah. Silly, right? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's good. And then, and the great thing about it, like I was surprised because we just rolled it out uh, last week. I signed, I was always thinking to myself because I had my BPM Latino account. I had my BPM Supreme account. Mm -hmm. And one thing I didn't like was I always had to go and log in to a separate site for BPM Latino to get Spanish stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now we just rolled it out. It's all together as one. So it's one login ID. Nice. And so when you log in, if you have BPM Latino, BPM Supreme, and BPM Create, you'll see all three tabs there. And it's like, where do you want to go? And you could just tag, you know, you just click on which part you want to go into. And now you go into that platform. And so it's just one login, one click, and you can choose wherever you want to go, which oh, cool. for me, I was like, oh, this is cool. And I, I remember I hit my marketing guy. I was like, dude, I go, I, was, I just logged in right now. And I was able to like have access. He's like, what? He goes, they already made it live? And he thought it wasn't live yet. But I think my account had like an admin access. So I was able to see what it would look right, like before right, it actually right. got pushed live. And I thank God because I almost like took a snapshot and be like, yo, it's actually it's live. live. Like, yo, it's working. <laughs> and, it, you know, I would have been like a day early or something like that, you know, and, and, right. and putting that on my socials and everything. But yeah. So, yeah, if you're just a music producer, you could totally just go there and you know, nice. sign up for BPM create. Um, you don't have to choose all three, uh, but it's, but if you happen to have all three, we just made it a lot simpler to get access to all th three different platforms from one login. That's cool. Now you're in Colorado now. Is that correct? I am. It's cool. 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 And so when do you, do you plan on coming back to LA anytime soon? I, I usually, I mean, before the pandemic hit, I was in LA almost every month or at least every other month. Uh, because it's such a short flight. It's like two yeah. hour and a half, you know, and, and I'm there and, you know, I have family over there. I got friends, my sister, you know, like it's pretty easy. So I was always there. Um, as for plans for coming back, I don't know. Um, it is something that I think right now we're open to anything. And I think the only reason that we've become a bit more open to possibilities is just due to the political climate of things now. And we are in Colorado. So needless to say, the ratio of Latinos to, you know, other cultural diversity and everything on is not as diverse as it is in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so much so that our youngest son, you know, even from when we got here, he didn't like it wow. uh, because he's mixed you know um i'm part japanese you know latin my wife my wife is salvadorian you know so you know our kids uh they look very mixed you know yeah. a little bit of the chinky eye a little bit of the tan <laughs> tropical skin you know um it is what it is you know but you know amongst other kids and everything obviously he looks different so um i think right now we're just waiting to see what happens obviously um and, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think overall we, you know, we want our kids to be very much aware of their um, cultural background, mm -hmm. uh, the history. Yeah, that's a must. And, that's a must. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, you know, we're, we're looking at different options right now. Um, we're open, but I, I couldn't really say right now at this point, like what 
is going to happen because there's so many uncertainties right now. So. Tell me about it. It is a wild world that we're living in. Well, yeah. listen, brother, I want to thank you so much for your time and sitting here and chatting with me on a, yet another episode of DJ to DJ, dude. You are definitely a force to be reckoned with, and uh, we appreciate everything that you've done for the DJ community, man, and thank you. Oh, awesome. Thank you for having me on the on the show and everything, man. As you can see, clearly, like I love, uh, you know, I love talking about gear and tech and music production and, you know, That's and good, yeah, man. and I can get heated about certain things sometimes. <laughs> but, but it's not like one thing I want people to understand is, you know, and anybody that knows me that I've worked with or I've helped mentor is I always want to see people succeed. Mm-hmm. I love seeing people create music and do something great. And I'm the first person that'll be like, man, congrats on that. That's actually a really cool project or that track was really dope. Like, I don't hate that way. Like, I love seeing people that I know and other friends come up. Uh, When I see people kind of just stagnant, you know, and they want, they talk about these things, but I I don't see them really heading down the right road to, you know, to do that. Then that's where it gets frustrating. And it's like, dude, like, and especially when I see somebody that I know has talent. Yeah. And it's like, dude, if you just applied yourself yeah. a little bit and just put in a little extra work, you would be like on fire, dude. Like you've got some really, you know, like talent there. And that's where it gets frustrating when you see a lot of people that have talent. There's the movie The Bronx Tale. I don't know if you've ever seen Wasted that. Wasted talent. Wasted talent. Yep. <laughs> exactly. I love that movie, dude. Love it. Exactly. Yep. Wasted yep. talent. And that's one thing that frustrates me is, is to see wasted talent. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when it's at the hand of that person, like nobody else's fault. That's all you, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm sure that many DJs, you know, that are just starting off and even those that have been at it for a while are going to learn a little something from this interview. And I appreciate you once again for taking the time. And of course, you who's watching right now and listening, uh, make sure that you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Of course, we're going to have all of Michael's links down below in the description. Thanks again, Michael. I really appreciate you, brother. And hopefully we'll be chatting again real soon, man. Anytime, anytime, man. Thank you. You got it, bro.